thought I'd do a video on building your own computer. I'm sure to a lot of you that means buying a motherboard and some peripherals, putting them into a case, and then calling that your computer build. That's not what this video is going to be about, but I thought for this video I'm going to use this old computer, so I thought I'd show you some of the peripherals that are in here. You can see there's six bays in this thing in the front. If you watch this PC get powered up, These are some postcodes. A lot of the old PCs, you'd have some jumpers here that could select these. And people would just program in what the clock speed was of the PC. I thought it'd be interesting to show some of the technology differences over the years since I've been involved with electronics. On the left here, we have a hard drive. This was made by Computer Memories Incorporated. It dates back to 1985. This is a Model 6426S. It's a 22 megabyte drive. It has two platters, and four heads. It has an MFM interface. Really good sized motor. Drive on the right. This is made by Seagate. This is a model ST251. This one was manufactured in 1987. This is a three platter six head drive. Holds about 42 megabytes formatted. Rotational speed on this drive is 3600 RPM. This unit here, this contains a Fujitsu drive. You can see here the SCSI ports are in the back. This is an identical drive to the one inside the case. These drives are model 2654HA. They have a formatted capacity of 2 gigabytes. They were built around 1993. These have a rotational speed, I think, of 7200 RPM. These were differential SCSI. can see this, this is a uh, 68,000 CPU. For their time, these drives were very fast. And this one is a Sony magnetic optical drive. Let's see here, Sony MO. It's a model SMO E502. Date code 1992. Just took these MO cartridges. Formatted capacity again, 2.6 gig. That would be interesting to compare the difference in the sound of these two drives. So we'll start with the ST251. Looking inside of the drive, this board here, this is a single-ended to differential SCSI converter. And this is what this drive sounds like.
what the machine looks like on the inside a lot of cabling it's looking at the back of the machine this is a uh, Keith Lee data acquisition card this is a SCSI port up here another serial and parallel port obviously your audio card Ethernet this is a custom board that I'm going to be showing the computer has a video capture board in here this is a video spigot or spigot the Microsoft developer tools actually always included the drivers for this so as they would update the OS the drivers for this would always get updated one thing I remember about this board is that it was always having intermittent problems. This board would cause the computer to lock up at random. And at one time I had actually looked into it and I don't remember quite what the deal was, but it seems like basically they had taken a clock and they had routed it from one corner of the board all the way to the other. And that was causing this huge amount of ringing. And you can see here I've added these two resistors these are two 3.3k ohm resistors and those were added to dampen out that clock and I remember after adding those two parts this card became very stable okay so it looks like all the hard drives are good unfortunately the DVD player was dead it's this one here Made by Toshiba. I've just gone ahead and swapped that out. This is a Philips CDD 2000. This is my first CD recorder. Give you an idea when that was made. Copyright 1996. And for those of you curious about the motherboard, the Zeus computer. This is a uh, dual 200 megahertz, just like shown here. That's actually what's in here. Here's the one CPU, and here's the second one here. Okay, I think we can go ahead and uh, hook up a monitor and a keyboard to this, and we should be good to go. This is the board down here that I want to show. So I'll go ahead and pull this thing out. There's three FPGAs on the board. There's two located under here. And then the large one here. There's some DRAM on it. There's some flash memory. And some static RAM up here. Here we can see the power supply the main oscillator see running at 50 megahertz this is the clock multiplier and distribution chip here we can see on the bottom side of the board it is all wire wrapped besides building the transient generator this is the last board I ever wire wrapped And see all the bypass caps usually a large tantalum with a small ceramic these sections of coax here are for the clock distribution this routes up to the two larger FPGAs this area here this is the DRAM At the time I was doing the work with the Altera, they had something called their Magnum license. Costs for these tools were, I think, about $6,000. Occasionally they'd run some kind of a discount deal, and you could pick up the tools for about $2,000. They actually had a dongle that would plug into the parallel port. So what I did is I reverse engineered the dongle, and then I implemented it inside of this FPGA. So this FPGA also has the postcode diagnostics. 
and it also has a synthesizer for the clock you see up here this is a 232 transceiver so basically I developed this board to design my own CPUs this wasn't for any kind of a business this is just for my own home hobby when I first started playing with FPGAs I built this board here this is the Altera Flex it's an 8200 series part a small gal basically mimics a printer port and allows me to program up this device you still had to use the dongle with this particular board it's, the board's pretty limited it just basically allows you to program up the FPGA put your logic in there and use this I.O. port that I could run out to some external circuitry you can see obviously this is an old 8-bit ISA board this was the second board I built and you can see now all the decode logic has been moved down into this FPGA and there is a ROM to boot this guy up this board actually has the security key programmed up into this Altera device you can see the addition of some static RAM a little bit larger 8000 series part this is an 8820 and again a large 37 pin I.O. connector see the tantalum bypass caps and some of the ceramics up around the FPGA Again, the board was fairly limited, and that's what drove me to build the third revision. This is a standalone board I built that's based around the Altera 8800. Again, all wire wrapped. Here we can see I have some ROM, some RAM. FPGA sits here. This is the status register, the data bus, the address bus. You have a reset and an enter key. Also, I have some peripherals in this case, an LCD. This will plug into the top. And there's also a keypad. And we can turn this on. You can see it runs a little program. It's a fairly simple design. Back when I was building this stuff, a lot of the work I was doing was in Verilog. Most of the stuff I do today is done in BHDL. I bought this book from a friend of mine who had gone to college. He was actually in computer science. The reason I wanted this book, see it has this designing a mini computer, and they talk about designing the PDP-8. So I found this quite fascinating. At the time we were using a PDP-8 for a sequencer, I don't know if you know what that is, but for axial leaded parts when they were through hole, uh, you would buy these reels of components, you'd feed those into a sequencer and then that would make a single reel of parts that were all in the order that you were going to place them on the board anyway I started reading this and I found it quite fascinating and later I bought this book which is a computer architecture and organization from John P Hayes and this book is basically just about computer architecture it dives into a lot more detail about how CPUs work Again, I was just doing this for my own interest. Again, this is a very good book. I found it to be quite helpful. Now, this bag, these are the cables that go with that board. And I 
fun suit we got here. So, if you remember, but the board had a serial port connector, and that's what this is for. Same thing here. This is your RS-232. This is a test header. So you plug this on the end and this is used for uh, self-diagnostics on the board. You just have a ribbon cable here. This plugs into the back of the board. This box here, I've got a few drivers to hook up the scope. This would be your RS-232. There's a couple of switches and there's a VGA port. For our first test, my plan is to install this connector here. We'll plug this into the back of the card and we'll try running some diagnostics on that board and we'll see if it still functions. <laughs> 